Without ado, I leave you the floor for yeah, 15 minutes presentation. Yeah. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you, Clara, for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation also to the project. It was uh, very interesting and uh, uh, very happy to co uh, contribute to some coding. And um, I'm super excited about the database that has been compiled. It's, it's absolutely impressive. And uh, especially that we have subnational data, and uh, which is, by the way, not yet explored in my paper, but I hope to do so in some further revisions. So, as Clara said, I'm going to talk about the well relation between anti-COVID-19 measures and democracy. So, um, well, I don't need to reiterate the uh, story of the COVID epidemic in. Uh, China, you know that in January 2020, the first cases appeared. There were super quick, dramatic restrictions in China. Um, and uh, But in February 2020, the virus also hits Europe. You see here the absolutely dramatic and um, traumatizing images from Italy, where you know uh, uh, coffins were unloaded from trucks in absolute incredible numbers in Bergamo. And um, they also needed to take measures, the European states against COVID. And one of the first interesting findings that is that uh, autocracies reacted differently than democracies. Democracies took more time to ex decide uh, dramatic measures. So that is something you can hear, you can see here in a paper published by a democ well, famous democracy research researchers. They found that autocracies were super quick in taking severe, severe restrictive measures against the spread of COVID, whether democracies take, uh, took more time. So there's the first difference between democracies and autocracies in the reaction to COVID. But if we look at the measures that were taken in European countries, we see also that the reactions were different within, well, across democracies. For instance, in uh, uh, Germany, uh, there were different uh, reactions in uh, at the subnational level. France, for instance, uh, decided the lockdown and the confinement in um, April, no, so in March uh, 2020, that was when we were all told, or the French were told to stay at home and even uh, under the threat of fines, you know, they could only go out to take the dog, uh, to walk the dog. Dogs were allowed out with their humans, so someone needed to come with them, but the humans were not. And uh, although uh, some countries took quite dramatic restrictions, France, Spain, Italy, others did not, such, such as Sweden, for instance, they stayed open basically and said, well, we're open, have a beer and uh, enjoy the sun. So there are quite different reactions to the same threat uh, across uh, European countries. And one of the questions is, of course, does this have to do with the nature and the quality of democracy in the different countries? So uh, here is the uh, reason why this question makes sense, because actually, well, uh, COVID-19 as any other crisis puts democratic governments in a, uh, well, dilemma. On the one hand, they need to protect citizens' health health and, and li save lives. So that's also fundamental, a fundamental right, the right to uh, to, to, to life and to uh, physical integrity. And on the other hand, of course, these restrictive measures, they violate uh, democratic principles, they violate the uh, civil liberties, you cannot assemble, you cannot reunite, you cannot uh, express your opinion in the street, you cannot demonstrate, for instance, which is at the basis of what, can we, what we can call vertical accountability, meaning the uh, citizens hold the, governor, the government to account. So the accountability between citizens and government. So vertical ap accountability is jeopardized by these restrictive measures. On the other hand, there is also another aspect of democratic governing, which is um, uh, hampered by these restrictions because uh, restrictive measures that we have seen, they require quick government action and uh, most, uh, as we will see later on, most decisions were actually taken by the executives uh, uh, alone. So there is a, uh, well, uh, a, draw, um, uh, a, re a reduction also of horizontal accountability, meaning to what extent different institutions are held accountable by other institutions, meaning, for instance, the government is held accountable by the parliament. So horizontal ac accountability uh, requires division of power, and this is restricted by these uh, anti-crisis measures. And of course, this dilemma is not a clear dilemma. It's not, uh, there is not a, a clear way of how, we, how far should we go, how far can we go, and uh, how far uh, do you want to go. So uh, this is actually the slack in the system that uh, explains why different democracies have uh, or could uh, opt for different options. 
The first research question, therefore, is can we explain differences in anti-COVID policies by the quality of democracy, the nature of democracy in different European countries. So we have published, we have done a, a, a study from which I'm start, I, I will um, quote uh, in the first um, part of my paper, where we examine the hypothesis that actually the quality of democracy plays a role to sh and, and shapes the measures against COVID. So we used uh, two measures to qualify the uh, COVID-19 um, measures that were taken in uh, by different governments. First is the Oxford COVID-19 response tracker that uh, you might have uh, heard of it as well. They basically measure the factual restriction restrictiveness of measures against COVID individual liberty. I mean, there is, this is an aggregated index. It's quite sophisticated in, in, in what it measures. And you can easily see <coughs> sorry, that there are huge differences between countries. So the lower this index, the less restrictive were the measures. So the high, the, the most restrictive measures were taken by Serbia, for instance, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Italy. You see Spain, for instance, also France somewhere up there. And then on the other hand, there is Sweden that was uh, mentioned just ago where you could still have a beer in the sun in the midst of the epidemic. And no one actually knew that in Iceland it was even less restrictive than uh, in Sweden. This is all during the first wave. And the second, um, indicator that we were looking at is the uh, degree to which power has been concentrated on the executive, uh, meaning you know uh, courts uh, interventions restricted, parliamentary uh, closed down, parliaments closed down, for instance. And we also see here that there is a quite a variance between different countries. Interestingly, for instance, uh, Switzerland is up here, so quite uh, a strong concentration of the power on the executive in the first wave, whereas other countries such as Austria, for instance, Denmark, Finland, uh, they concentrate what there was m power mu much less concentrated on the executive, meaning that parliamentary control was still very uh, uh, sure. So what we did is basically we plotted this, these different, these two indices against a measure of the quality of democracy. I'm not going to uh, enter into details of the measure of the quality of democracy. This is a a uh, tool that was developed by Sarah Engler, or uh, further developed by Sarah Engler and her team, um, which measures democracy in a very fine-grained way. Uh, it's also a highly aggregated index. You can dis disaggregate it in the paper. Also, we, we look at uh, uh, lower um, levels of aggregation of the quality of democracy. But, but, you, but what you basically see is there is a clear relationship between the quality of democracy and the restrictiveness of the um, measures against the spread of COVID. So this is the this is the Oxford government response uh, tracker here, and this is the power concentration index. And you see basically countries with a democracy that are that is of higher quality uh, are less likely to decide restrictive measures, and they are also less likely to decide uh, well to to concentrate power on uh, the executive. Switzerland here is an outlier actually uh, because they had. Uh, well, high quality democracy, uh, but uh, a higher concentration on the executive. Now, what I would, what I did in the paper is I tried to show whether this is a relationship that also shows in the exceptions data because this data is different, as uh, Sebastian uh, just mentioned. It's a data not on what actually happened on the ground, but it's a data about public. It's data about public decision making. So the question here is, how is how can we look at uh, the democratic nature of public decision making that is in the exceptions database? And if we look at the single acts that were decided at the national level, we can see that uh, there is a well quite a s strong variety of the share of decisions that were actually made by parliaments or approved by parliaments or that were not. I mean, in general, we can see that the governments were clearly in the driving in the driver's seat. So th it was 80 or something percent of all decisions that are in the exceptions database were decided by governments alone. And only about 15 percent were decided by parliaments or approved by parliaments. But uh, this share varies quite strongly uh, across uh, countries. And if we plot this share of um, acts decided by parliament in the exceptions, exceptions country against a uh, measure for the quality of democracy. I use uh, various indices from the VDEM project to, to, to do this. This is just one of three graphs which uh, are in the paper actually, where you can see 
this is, for instance, the index of par for participatory democracy. There is other indices, index for liberal democracy, index for electoral democracy, etc. different ways of measuring the quality of democracy by the uh, very famous VDEM uh, project. And you can see the same relation basically in all the different graphs. So the share of um, parliament approved decisions is higher if the quality of democracy is higher. So this is the same finding that we can reproduce also with the ex exceptions database. So the question uh, that, of course, we I asked uh, on the first uh, uh, on, on, uh, in the first step here, there is indeed differences between countries regarding restrictions regarding re concentration on the executive and regarding parliament involvement in decision making about uh, COVID. And what we consistently find here is that countries with higher quality of democracy are more likely to live up to democratic principles even in times of crisis. So this is good news, in fact, in, uh, from the point of view of democracy. So if you have a strong democracy, democracy stays stronger also in times of crisis. Now the question that uh, Sebastian asked at the outset, does this mean that, democratic, that democracies have less uh, effectiveness in acting on the uh, pandemic? This is, of course, the very important question. Um, it could be that because democracies cannot decide restrictive measures as, well, non-democracies or less good democracies can, they might be, well, empty-handed when it comes to actually uh, halting the spread of, the, uh, of, of, of COVID. Um, the hypothesis behind there would be higher quality of democracy leads to more COVID deaths. So this would be the price we have to pay for democracy in some way. Of course, we did not uh, use, we did not look at this uh, uh, relationship for uh, our own, but I would like to point out a study that has been done by the VDEM team uh, on what they call pandemic backsliding. They created an index of violation of democratic standards um, and, and measure this in uh, countries all over the world. So you can see the darker it is here, the more countries have violate, violated democratic standards in uh, fighting COVID. Of course, autocracies have been much more frequent to violate, violate democratic standards, but you can see that also in, across democracies, there are quite, there's quite a variance in uh, this violation of democratic standards. For instance, here, that's all, that's, uh, in, in the United States, for instance, there were quite some uh, problems uh, there. Now, is this related in any way to uh, the number of COVID-19 uh, related deaths? I don't show you the regression models that they all did, but they find no significant correlation between COVID-19 deaths and violation of democratic standards. So this means that illiberal or autocratic practice, and that's the conclusion they come to, do not play a significant role in reducing COVID-19 deaths. So you should not sacrifice democracy on uh, the reasons of effectiveness to, uh, uh, to fight uh, the pandemic. Now, this does not mean that democracies, this shows that you can act effectively against uh, the spread of COVID-19 without violating democratic standards. So democracies can also act strongly. And I want to, uh, f to conclude on uh, telling you a couple of things about the Swiss case, which shows how this went uh, about. First of all, in the first wave, there was a health state of uh, emergency that was declared. And as I showed you, it was quite a high degree of uh, concentration of the power on the ex executive. Uh, mostly, I mean, the high uh, value of the indicator actually goes back to the fact that the parliament stopped sitting. So uh, after, in, in March uh, 2020, when, for instance, the French were confined, the Swiss parliamentarians uh, said, well, uh, I'd rather go home and stay home rather than uh, stay in parliament and infect myself uh, from all the fellow parliamentarians. So, they, I mean, they could have found other solutions, such as in Italy or in France or wherever, where they would, you know, every, every fifth parliamentarian would sit and the others would, you know, participate online or something. But no, they decided, well, we'll uh, rather leave it all to the, uh, to the government and we go home and uh, take care of our families. So the parliament stopped sitting for two months. Uh, which is something that is not foreseen by emergency legislation at all. So it's not the government that dissolved or sent Parliament home, it was the Parliament that sent itself home. The interesting problem then being that Parliament did not decide how it would decide about reconvening again. So uh, the government actually had to ask Parliament to reconvene again after the first uh, wave, which was kind of a, a legal problem because theoretically the government is not able constitutionally to tell the Parliament what to do. But anyway, 
This is how they pragmatically went about. So they reconvened in uh, uh, June, and they also and, and the, the reconvening of the parliament also marks the beginning of a, let's say, normal legislation period for uh, COVID-19 measures. COVID-19 measures then uh, became debated in parliament. They became law. Uh, the first uh, heavy debate on the COVID-19 law was in September 2020. It was revised once in December 2020 and once again in March 2021. It was decided and absolutely according to constitutional criteria and procedures as an urgent federal decree, which in Switzerland means a referendum is postponed. So you can still ask for a referendum on the law, but only after the thing has already entered into uh, force and after one year of um, force of this uh, uh, law. And there was a referendum that was asked uh, and uh, was uh, signed up for. Uh, you might know that in Switzerland there is uh, 50,000 signatures required to ask for an optional referendum. Now this referendum uh, in a record time uh, collected the double of the signatures, so they already uh, after some uh, weeks, they had uh, 100,000 signatures. It was put to a vote in June 2021, and 60% of the population actually accepted it. So it, it was approved in the first round. Then there was another referendum that was uh, um, um, asked for uh, against the uh, s the third, no, so it's the second revision, so the third version of the. COVID-19 uh, law, which actually contained the legal basis for the uh, Certificat COVID, the Green Pass, which uh, was uh, very much criticized by people who did not want to be uh, confined. So the second, the second revision, the first revision, sorry, the second version that, uh, of the law was not very disputed because this was basically about uh, economic help to businesses that were, that were locked down. So this was not disputed, but the Green Pass especially was uh, uh, that was contained in the, 2020, in the, in the March 2021 revision. And uh, this was also approved in the popular vote. And the, actually the, the campaign was one of the fiercest campaign in uh, well recent uh, political history in Switzerland. The, 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 it was very heated debate. There were lots of you know, demonstrations in, this, in the street. There were uh, ads all over the place with, uh, well, conspiracy theory arguments about why one should vote no against this COVID law, etc. Nevertheless, the approval rate was even higher than the first, uh, than against the first. So 62% of the Swiss uh, citizens voted in favor of this second version of the, sorry, the third version of the COVID law. And the, the extraordinarily uh, heated campaign just had the effect of increasing turnout. So in turnout was one of the highest in recent political history in Switzerland. The consequences of this direct democratic vote against the COVID law, or let's say in favor of the COVID law, was that uh, it there was a high democratic legitimacy that this legislation afterwards enjoyed, and the opposition quickly demobilized. So, you know, these organizations that had created the associations that had come up, they basically fell apart, and there was not much um, left after the second vote against uh, the uh, COVID-19 law. So what conclusion can we draw from this short and superficial analysis. First of all, we can say that uh, we have different databases uh, co collected in a completely independent manner that also with different measures of the quality of democracy clearly show that there is a tendency that the quality of democracy makes a difference for COVID-19 responses. Uh, we have sec we have ev evidence also from others that say uh, that that suggest that autocratic and illiberal action does not necessarily contribute to reducing deaths, so we so should not sacrifice democracy on the reason of effectiveness. But of course, this is provisional uh, evidence. Uh, the epidemic is not over. Probably uh, we can only really have a final uh, answer after a couple of years from now. And um, the final uh, conclusion uh, from the case of Switzerland, we can even say that citizen participation and direct democracy, contrary to what I told Simon and uh, Clara last night at dinner, um, one should not be afraid of direct democracy and citizen participation. Even in a time of crisis such as this one, it contributes to the legitimacy of policymaking and the legitimacy of crisis management and also probably to the effectiveness of uh, crisis management. Thank you very much uh, and I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. <laughs>